One of the advantages of working with rectifiable sets is that there are some easy geometric criteria that imply the existence of rectifiable sets. And one set of criteria that we're going to study in this video involve cones. So let's define what we mean by a cone. So given the point x in Rn and a plane v in uh, an n minus m dimensional plane v, and number alpha from 0 to 1, we let the cone centered at x with axis v and aperture alpha to be the set of points y, such that the distance between y and the plane v plus x, so this is the plane uh, parallel to v but passing through x, so this distance is less than y minus x times alpha. So here I've illustrated what this cone looks like. So if this is the the this is the center of the cone x, and this blue line is the axis v plus x, we see that as we uh, move away from the point x, the most that any point inside the cone is allowed to be away from v plus x is growing at a rate alpha. And so the smaller that alpha is, the tighter that this cone is around the axis v plus x. So you can almost think of alpha as the angle uh, of or the width of this cone. Okay, an alternative definition can be given using uh, the following. So this cone is equivalent to the set of points y such that their orthogonal projection into v perp. So down here I have not v perp but v perp translated so it passes through the point x. Uh, so that the orthogonal projection into this plane of x minus y is less than y minus x times alpha. Or in other words, it's a set of points so that when I project these points down into the plane v perp, their distance decreases by at least a factor alpha. So I can see here that I have a vector y in this cone, and when I project it down, it gets it's brought closer to the point x by a factor alpha. Okay. Now, we can also define a truncated cone. So this has a very similar definition. So the truncated cone center at x of radius r, axis v, and aperture alpha is just the cone, or the sort of cone with infinite radius, center at x with the same parameters, but intersected with the ball bxr. So what this looks like is, so if this ball here, so if this is x again, and this radius here is r, all I do is just throw out everything from the infinite cone that's outside this ball. And so the picture that you should have in mind is something like this. So this is what a truncated cone center x of radius r uh, should look like. Now, given the subset A of Euclidean space, we say that a point x in A is an m-dimensional cone point if there is a number alpha between 0 and 1, some radius r bigger than 0, and some n minus m dimensional plane v, so that if we look at the truncated cone with center x, radius r, axis v, aperture alpha, its intersection with A is the empty set. Okay, So here I have a picture of sort of what a cone point should look like. So this red point here denotes the point x, and we can see here that this two-sided truncated cone does not intersect the curve at any point. So it would look like that it intersects at the point x, but by the way that we've defined cones, the cone does not contain its uh, apex x. So it might be a little confusing why we defined m-dimensional cones using n minus m-dimensional planes, uh, but hopefully it'll become clear in the following slide. So first of all, let's review what we mean by a Lipschitz graph. So we say that set gamma is an m-dimensional Lipschitz graph if there is an m-dimensional plane v and a Lipschitz function f from v into v perp so that the image of the function x plus f of x is equal to the set gamma. Okay, so the kind of picture to have in mind is, let's say this is my plane v and this is v perp, and then the graph of the function looks you know, something like this. So it's just like a rotated version of the kind of graph that you would have seen in calculus of a real valued function. However, one thing to keep in mind when thinking about Lipschitz graphs is that um, this plane v perp can be more than one dimensional. So that means that for uh, graphs into a higher dimensional space, there isn't a notion of a point being below the graph or above a graph. In fact, you could have a graph that's sort of spinning around the axis v. 
Okay, so the following theorem says that if we have a set A and a plane V uh, of dimension n minus m with the property that for every x in A, the infinite cone center x V alpha, so not a truncated cone, but the whole cone center at x has empty intersection with A, then if this happens at every point x in the set A, then A is contained inside a Lipschitz graph. Okay, so in the plane, it's kind of easier to see why this is true. So let's say these are points in A. So each one of them is a cone point, and so I've uh, shown all the cones at each one of these points. And you'll notice that no point is inside the cone of any other point. So in the plane, you can sort of sketch what the graph should look like. It's going to be this sort of lower envelope of the upper cones, okay? Um, now, how do we prove rigorously that there exists a, uh, a Lipschitz graph, especially in higher dimensions where we can't illustrate like this? So uh, notice, recall that by the definition of a cone, so remember that y is in the cone uh, x v alpha. One of the alternate definitions was if the projection into v perp of x minus the projection v perp of y is less than alpha x minus y. So thus, if y is not inside this cone, then that means that the opposite inequality is true, that this is at least alpha. So what this says is that if I have a point x and a point y not inside the cone, then the projection into v perp is going to be a bi Lipschitz map on this pair of points. So let's recall what these items are in our picture. So here's our plane V. So all these cones have axis uh, parallel to V. And so V perp is going to be perpendicular to this plane. So let's say this is V perp right here. So this statement says that whenever I have a point X and some point Y not inside the cone, then the projection into V perp is by Lipschitz on this pair of points. However, notice that if every point X inside A satisfies this property, that means that no point is in the cone of any other point, which means that any pair of points X and Y inside my set A satisfy this condition here. And so that implies that my the orthogonal projection into V perp is by Lipschitz on the set A. So in particular, this means that the function pi v perp has a inverse function, at least when I restrict to the image of A under the projection. And now when I look at the when I look at the composition of this function with V, now I have a function that maps from a subset of V perp into V. So what I do is I extend using, for example, Chris Brown's extension theorem. So I extend this to a Lipschitz function f from the m-dimensional plane v perp into v. And then from here, it's not hard to show that the graph of this function f over v perp, the graph of this function over v perp is going to contain all the points inside a. We can use the previous theorem to prove the following result. So given a set A, the set of its m-dimensional cone points is an m-rectifiable set. Okay, so part of the challenge in proving this uh, is that in comparison to the previous theorem, every point has a cone of a particular radius with a particular aperture and a particular axis. Okay, so uh, I'll just sketch the ideas of the proof. So the first thing that we observe is that if we take a dense collection of n minus m dimensional planes and a dense collection of apertures alpha, then you can show that the cones at each one of the cone points will contain a slightly smaller truncated cone with axis v and aperture alpha belonging to these uh, countable sets that uh, we just defined. So that means that without loss of generality, we can just focus on the cone points inside our set that are all uh, that each have the same axis V and same aperture alpha. Okay, so here I've illustrated all the cone points inside my set that have 
an axis V running sort of uh, vertically along the slide, and they all have the same aperture. But now each cone has its own radius. So now what we do, imagine taking a dense collection of points along my set A, and at each point, consider all balls of rational radii centered at that point. So the collection of all balls that I get in this way is sort of a, uh, a collection of balls dense in the collection of all balls centered on my set. So now I'm just gonna highlight one of these balls centered on my set, and I'm only gonna consider uh, all the cone points inside this ball where the radii of the cone at these cone points extends beyond the ball. So if I throw away everything outside the ball and throw away the uh, cone points where the, where the cones do not extend outside the ball, I get this picture. But now notice that if I extend these cones to infinite cones, now these infinite cones won't intersect uh, the points, the cone points inside this ball. And the reason why is because if these cone points did, well, because they, these infinite cone points extend outside the ball, if they intersected my set, they would have to do so inside these smaller truncated cones. But by assumption, uh, these cones don't intersect my set A at all, since they're centered at cone points with this axis, um, with all with the same axis and same aperture. So, Thus, now I have this portion of my set, uh, portion of my cone points contained inside this ball uh, that have the property that each one is not only a cone point, but there is an infinite cone um, at that point that does not intersect the rest of my set. And the axes for each one of these individual cones and the apertures are all the same. So now I can apply the theorem from the previous slide to show that the cone points uh, inside this ball are all contained inside a Lipschitz graph. And now I do that for every ball in my sort of countable dense collection of balls. And uh, since, uh, and then when I do this, I can actually show that the set of cone points is contained in a countable union of Lipschitz graphs and is hence rectifiable.